algebra. Today will be our first online lecture covering chapter two, points, vectors, and independence. Last week in class, we looked at local and global coordinate systems. You should know the differences. You should know how they're related to one another. And you should actually go on over some of the homework problems at the back of the chapter. If not, you might want to because, as always, last week and this week are both fair game for in-class questioning. So today's overview, we're going to look at the introduction to points and vectors in 2D. What are the differences between them? We'll look at how to combine vectors into vector fields, talk about properties like length of a vector, combining vectors, what about combining points. We'll then look at broader issues in a, after the intermission of independence, dot products, orthogonal projections, inequalities, and what you should know. So you have probably all have this basic idea in your head, you've seen it before in high school, of points and vectors. We're going to try and formalize that, but we're also going to be going pretty quickly. So let's think about how these have some practical applications. Think back to Hurricane Katrina approaching southwest Louisiana. The air is moving very rapidly. It's spiraling because of the storm, and it's actually spiraling faster as it reaches the eye of the hurricane. The air movement in this kind of storm, in fact, you'll sometimes see it on the news, is shown as points where they can talk about the speed and direction of the wind. This is actually an example of a vector field. If we take 2D slices of this, even though it's a 3D storm, we can look at the ground level and say how much wind direction and speed is there at each location on the ground and do a bunch of this, or you could go to the top of the cloud. So different 2D slices actually provide uh, different information, different heights, but each of those 2D slices provides lots of very useful information. In this chapter, we're going to talk about how we can use points and vectors and a bunch of their properties to make sure we have good grounding for the rest of our linear algebra. Let's start with points and vectors. So a point refers to a location. It's a point in a coordinate system. We're going to generally use the notation of a bold-faced letter, and we're going to write it as a column vector, in this case in two dimensions, P1, P2, and P1 and P2 are the coordinates, and you can imagine in higher dimensions the vector will be longer. 2D points live in a space. For example, the 2D Euclidean space, which is represented as E2, which we'll talk about in this chapter, is a place in which points can live. So we'll see points can live in lots of different spaces. Um, can you think of some other spaces that they might live in? Can you think of any discrete spaces that are not continuous? Can you think of points in spaces that aren't even really numbers? You can, probably, and we'll see how we can deal with some of those throughout this semester. But for today's lecture, we're going to keep points in Euclidean space E2 just to make things easy to remember. So what about vectors? Well, vectors is really the difference of two points. It's the easiest way of thinking about what it, how to get them. And again, our notation is, in the book, uh, boldface lowercase letters. So V, it's also written as a column vector V1 and V2, where, which these are the components. And the idea of a vector is, if I add vector V to P, it moves me to Q. So if I'm at P, think of a, a vector, uh, P is a point, V is a vector that's got a tail at the point P, a head that moves it to the point Q. So it's an arrow that goes from this point to that point. And when we actually work on vectors, we calculate each point separately. Here we see the example in 2D, although you could generalize it. Now, just to broaden beyond the book, um, recognize that there's lots of other notations for vectors. You may have some, seen some of this back in high school. Many people will put a little arrow or a little caret kind of symbol over a vector. Um, sometimes they'll actually use the pair of points. Here's a vector from P to Q or from A to B. And in fact, in some places, they'll use both notations simultaneously. So this vector little a is also the vector from A to B. Um, we can have other vectors. Here's a little v. So all of these are different notations. In general, you should be able to tell vectors and points from their context. Um, although we'll try and, and use the follow the notation of the book. Um, remember that there are other representations. So, although I said you can think of the vectors in between two points, in a broader sense, a vector is a direction and a distance. It's a displacement. V can be obtained by subtracting two points, so P minus Q gives me V. But after I do that, I actually want to think of the vector V as having its tail at the origin and its head pointing in some direction and having some displacement or some distance. Okay. The length of that vector can be interpreted in many different varieties. It can be distance, it can be speed, it can be force. All of those can be interpreted from the same vector. So when we say a vector has meaning, 
It's because we put it in a space where that meaning is going to be interpreted. Okay, as I've already used the terms, vectors have a head and a tail. Unlike a point, a vector doesn't actually define a position. All of these four vectors here are really the same vector. They have the same direction and length starting from their tail, and you can put their tail anywhere they want. Two vectors are equal if they have the same components. Okay, their components don't say where in space they will be. They just say, add this much to the first component, add this much to the second. And any number of vectors can have the same direction and length. Okay, if you're like me and you have a hard time remembering funny terms like heads and tails, you look at these and say, which is the head and the head's the tail. Um, here's a little drawing to make it a little bit easier. Think of the tip of the arrow as the nose, put the eyes there, and that's the head. It's going from the tail to the head, and you'll be able to remember which way it goes. So there are some very special examples, some very special vectors. The zero vector, which is generally written as the bold number zero, is the column vector of two zeros. This vector is very special because it has no direction and no length, and it'll have some very special properties. There's some other vectors that are also pretty important. In any coordinate space, we can have the basis vectors for that coordinate. So in Euclidean space, E1 of 1, 0, and E2 of 0, 1 gives us a basis vector. Okay. In general, vectors live in some space. So we can say that vectors live in R2. Other names for R2 are the real space. We'll also talk about vector spaces, and later on we'll talk about very general vector spaces. So there's lots of places you can put them. So sort of coming back, we can talk about points in the Euclidean space, vectors in real space, but real space in Euclidean space can actually be overlaid, and so we can talk about uh, Euclidean and linear spaces together, and I can have points and vectors. In fact, I can use points to move vectors around, and I can then put them at places in the space. Okay, This is really important to remember. The, the data structure for points and vectors looks the same. In C or in Java, you'd encode, you, could, you could encode them as arrays of size 2 for 2D. Can they be used interchangeably? No. The software might let you use a point where you wanted a vector if you're not careful. For that reason, I recommend whenever you're implementing these on a computer, you actually try and use something that's strongly typed and make your points and vectors classes that have operators so that you can add two vectors, but as we'll see, you don't really want to add two points. Um, and that makes it a little bit easier to keep track and, and not have accidental errors where you combine things that you shouldn't be doing. Okay? Um, but as you saw, the representations look the same, so you have to think about it. Now, do points always live in E2? Do vectors always live in R2? No, these are just examples. You can actually talk about points in R2. You can talk about vectors in E2, right? because they're spaces, and you can embed various things. When we talk about embeddings more formally later, we'll talk about the properties that come with them, and then you'll see how those two spaces are separated. OK, so coming back to the, the points and, and vectors, I said they're not interchangeable. The primary reason for differentiating between points and vectors is to allow us to achieve geometric constructions that are coordinate independent. Manipulations that are applied to geometric objects produce the same result regardless of the location of the coordinate system. That's what we mean by coordinate independent. In fact, last chapter when we talked about global coordinates and local coordinates, one of the reasons we wanted local coordinates is so we could do stuff and then move it around and put it in the global coordinate space. That's an example of doing something where we have things that are done in, in a space, then we want them to be coordinate independent. So the local coordinate system constructions are then independent of the global coordinate system. Okay? But we can also talk about more fundamental properties. So for example, the midpoint of two lines, that construction doesn't depend on if the points are in R2 or E2. It only depends on the spaces having points in a meaningful way. Um, so we want to try and make a more general separation of these. And it becomes clear if we analyze some of the fundamental manipulations we want to apply to points and vectors. So when we say that we want them to be manipulations applied, we have to talk about what manipulations. So let's look at some basic ones. Um, subtracting one point from another yields, uh, subtracting a point from another point, p minus q, yields a vector v. Okay, so is that uh, coordinate independent? Yes, no matter how I change E1 or E2, I will get a vector V when I subtract P and Q. Okay, if I were to change the scale of them, the scale of the vector would change, but it would still be approximately independent of the actual definition of the coordinate system. 
if we want to talk about other things, we can talk about adding or subtracting two vectors. If we add or subtract two vectors, they yield another vector. So if I take a vector v and a vector w and I add them, I get this vector v plus w. And it actually follows what's called the parallelogram rule, if you want to think of it that way. I can take v, and actually I just take the, the second vector, w, and I put its tail at the head of v, and I get v plus w. If I want to get v minus w, I take w at the end of v, and I go the opposite direction. And you can sort of see this forms a parallelogram, a particular shape, um, that is easy to keep track of where they're going to go. And you can also see that this is coordinate independent, since the, the vectors are defined as a difference of these points, when I go to do all these operations, it's still coordinate independent. It doesn't matter where I put the origin in this space. Okay. Well, scaling is another important operation. If I scale a vector by a scalar s, so I have my vector v from here to here. If I multiply it by 2, I get a vector that's going in the same direction but twice as long. If I multiply it by half, same direction, half as long. If I multiply it by minus 1, I get actually the opposite direction. So think of the vector as saying start at the tail and go this many units in that direction. Well, when I multiply minus 1, I want to go by this many units in the opposite direction. An important case is if s is 0, the result is a zero vector, which as we said, has no real direction and has no length. So that'll, that's a very special case. Um, if I wanted to think about things, I can also talk about adding a point to a vector. Now this is important because a point plus a vector is a point, not a vector. So any combination of two or more points and or vectors form one or more coordinate independent operations. So I can take a point plus half w. So I can also combine these scalar operations. If I take things that were coordinate independent and I combine them, they still continue to be coordinate independent. So P plus V gives me the point Q. P plus a half W, there's no W here, but W is going this way. So P plus a half W would be over here someplace. And you can put all these together. So now, what about just points? Can we talk about some of these operations? So let's imagine this point, uh, and I want to scale it. Well. Scaling a point actually isn't very well defined. Again, think back to a point. It's a point in that space. So if I was at this solid black point and I scaled it by one half, I want to move halfway towards the origin. But if the origin is down here, that gives me this point. If the origin was up here, it gives me that point. Vectors came with their own idea of a tail and direction, so scaling them was well defined. Here, a point is just a position in the coordinate space. So if I take the point 3, 4, and I multiply it by a half, I get a point, but I get a point that depends on what's the coordinate space. So I have to be very careful how I do that. Adding two points is also not generally well-defined. So if I take these two black points and I add them, I can get these different points, depending on if this is my coordinate system, I get this as an answer. This is my coordinate system, I get this as my answer. So again, it's a little complicated, but we can't really always add points. Now, there are some very special combinations of points that are allowed. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. So when we go to play with these things, we've now talked about how they can be coordinate independent, so I can put vectors. So we can now talk about this idea of a vector field. Every point in a region is assigned a vector. So if you think back to Katrina, in fact, you might be able to see a spiraling storm in here. At every point, I can think of a vector having an arrow, Right? A tail at this, the tail is at that point, and the direction it says where to go, and these might be the winds spiraling in. So if you're simulating air velocity, the lighter gray, in the, the, the brightness or darkness, in this case, indicates the velocity, the length of the vector, and the arrowhead represents the direction. You could also do this, and you might have seen this every now and then in the nude where, news, where they actually have a bunch of arrows where the length uh, shows the, the, the magnitude and the arrow shows the direction. That gets to be complicated when you have lots of very dense data because the arrows start overlapping each other and it's harder to see. So this representation of using brightness is velocity is a nice way of doing it. Visualization of a vector field requires discretizing it. A finite number of points in pairs are selected, so we have to put those down, say I'm going to sample it at this spacing, and that becomes important um, when we talk about things later on. Because a discrete field is not the same as a continuous field, we want to make sure we can represent both of them. Obviously, if the space was discrete, then we don't have to discretize it. It started that way. Uh, there's lots of other applications of vector fields besides airflow. 
Um, it could be, for example, air flows for automotive and aerospace design. We're talking about the flow of stuff um, for aerodynamic simulations. But there's lots of other places where they go in, for example, flows of fluids. They can even be electron flows. They can be the pressure waves inside seismic readings on the ground. They can be how crowds are moving in an approximation. Crowds are very discrete. But I can think about how everyone's moving in a crowd. And all of those become ways of thinking about vector fields. So there's lots of simulations in which we flow... We, we characterize vector fields and the flows that they can represent. So when we start talking about these, it's, we've talked about how to represent them, giving some information. I've actually talked about the length of the magnitude of a vector a couple times. I guess we ought to be precise and define it. So the length of the magnitude of a vector can, be represent, can represent distance, velocity, or acceleration, or whatever else we want it to in that space. And we really define it in the obvious way. This is a tail and a head, we take the Euclidean length of that vector. So we take v1 squared plus v2 squared. That gives us the square of the distance. So the, the actual length or magnitude is the square root of v1 plus v2. And then we consider that the Euclidean norm of a vector. Um, the norm right, is because the vector is itself position independent. It doesn't care where we put the vector in that space, just v1 plus v2 squared. When we scale a vector, it has the nice property that k times a vector is equal to the, the magnitude of, of a vec vector scaled by k is the absolute value of k times the magnitude of the vector. Okay? Now the nice thing about that is it gives us this idea that we can now go back and talk about a very special vector which we call the normalized or unit vectors where the length of the vector is 1. In this case the vector has a direction but its length is already known ahead of time to be 1 and given any vector that is not the null vector or the zero vector we can scale it I can take v divided by the length of the vector and give us a unit vector w. So each component of v is scaled by the non-negative scalar value, the magnitude of v. So for a 1D vector, or sorry, a 2D vector, what's that going to look like? Normalizing it will look like the first component will be v1 divided by the square root of v1 plus squared plus v2 squared, and the second component will be v2 divided by the square root of v1 plus v2 squared. And you can see why that's bad if v1 and v2 are both 0, I'm going to get 0 over 0, which is not a good thing. So we try and avoid that. Um, so that's not a well-defined concept. Um, unit vectors point in a direction. They have a nice direction. They're infinitely many directions because there's as many directions as we want. But if I put a, a bunch of them together, I get things that start to look like circles because they're all unit length, and we put them all together that way. Um, if I want to, to think about unit vectors, they have the property, as soon as you told me it's a unit vector, I know it's length. I don't have to worry about it. And it makes a bunch of operations simpler to think about. It's just a direction. Okay, so the, the length of a vector turns out to also be the same because we define it that way. The difference between two points, P and Q, or Q and P, gives us V. Then we can use that as a way of estimating the distance between two points. I can take the square root of, I can just make V. So if this is Q, this is P. Q minus P is minus 2 and 2. And I can take the square root of minus 2 squared, which is 2, or 4. 2 squared, which is 4. It's 8. Square root, of, or square root of 8 is 2.83. That tells us that the distance between these two points. Now, you already probably knew how to do the distance between two points, but you can sort of see how these two things are related. Just checking that we said a vector is the difference between two points. We talked about the length of the vector, and now we see that the length of the vector is the same as the distance between those two points. If I want to talk about combining points, there is a very meaningful uh, representation. If I think of the line connecting P and Q, I can talk about the midpoint of that line. So... And that turns out to be coordinate independent. So given the point, uh, I can compute the point R, two points P and Q, I can compute them very straightforwardly. In fact, I don't even have to deal with just the midpoint. I can define R by adding an appropriately scaled vector. P plus one half V gives me R. Okay, so that gives me R as one half P plus one Q. But now you can sort of see why this one becomes well defined because it's really an operation of a point plus a vector. And of course, there's nothing magical about the factor one half. You can imagine here putting p plus one third v, p plus minus v. There's a bunch of things you can do. As long as it's p plus some constant times v, it's going to be well defined and positionally independent. So I can actually think of the general case. I can think about the point the, the point r defined by p plus t for some parameter t times q minus p, which is v. Okay. Or equivalently, r is equal to 1 minus t plus, uh, times p plus t times q. Okay? And that gives me a point along this line. And we'll come back to that uh, later on. We'll talk about more formal representations. 
So the scalar values 1 minus t and q are called coefficients of the points along this line. That particular set of weighting are called barycentric combinations, a weighted sum of points where the coefficients of those points sum to 1. Okay, when, one, when the point R is expressed in terms of two other points, the coefficients are the barycentric coordinates. We said they're coordinates, they're actually barycentric coordinates. We can also construct R where anywhere on the line defined by P and Q, which is called linear interpolation. If it's between P and Q, linear extrapolation, and sometimes just called linear interpolation even when you're outside of P and Q. Um, and then, then that context T is called a parameter. If we restrict R to the line segment between P and Q, then we only allow convex combinations, and T is between 0 and 1, and that's a very formal linear interpolation. We go from P when, Q is, uh, when T is equal to 0 to Q when T equals equal to 1. And outside the line segment, we don't say there's a line. It's a line segment, has ends. So, you know, we can obviously put together lots of things. We can also talk about the ratio of T to T minus uh, 1 minus T, or T divided by 1 minus T. That gives us a ratio, which is the length of the vector R minus P divided by the length of the vector Q minus R. And in physics, this was called the center of gravity. Okay, and even though we've done it only here on a line, you can actually talk about it in general with uh, a bunch of weights and barycentric coordinates. Okay, so what are the barycentric coordinates, if that's the question? How do we find them? Well, we can look at the ratio of, of P to Q, so given some point R, we can take these ratios, and I just take that and I go back and I say, oh, well, that tells me what is T, and then given T, I can put that back into Q. So there's lots of ways you can use those to, to estimate things. Making that an example, going back to, the, to the, that same example, if I put this point where R is one unit from Q and three units from P, we can then put that together, estimate the length of R minus P, the length of Q minus R, that gives us the overall length. We can then put that into our ratios and get T, and then verify that, in fact, this does work. If I go back to these sets of points, I get 0.25 times this plus 0.75 times this vector gives me that point in the middle. So you can see these are all related. Given enough of them, you can compute the other ones. Coming back to our combining points, so here we have it uh, now beyond a line. Given three non-collinear points, Q and P and R, any point that can be formed from the combination of R plus T times P minus R plus T2 times Q minus R. So I now have this vector and that vector, and I can then therefore think of this as combining a point plus two vectors. As you recall, we said that combining a point plus a vector was coordinate independent, so it's now another coordinate independent element. Adding another vector is just going to keep it coordinate independent, so all of this is uh, coordinate independent. We get these barycentric coordinates. And in this representation, T1, T2, and T3, because we can represent this as some mixed combination of them, gives us the barycentric coordinates of the point S with respect to R, P, and Q. And what space does this form? As you can sort of see here, this space in gen for general P, Q, and R, non-collinear, will form a triangle if I stick with T1, T2, and T3 all between 0 and 1. It'll form a triangle. If T1, T2, and T3 are not constrained, they can be any number, then actually it forms the whole space. So if we want to combine points so the result is a vector, the coefficients that we want to do uh, to keep in barycentric coordinates must sum to 0. So E is equal to R minus 2P plus Q. Does E have a geometric meaning? Okay, so the sum of the coefficients is 0. We've checked that, right? 1, minus 2, 1, 0. So E is a vector, and then you can actually go back and figure out what that vector is. You can rewrite this as R minus P plus Q minus P. Okay, and any time I can rewrite my set of points, uh, my, my set of information as a sum of vectors, it's a vector. Okay, so now we're going to try a couple of problems here. I want you to think about these. I want you to think about them for real even though this is a video, I want you to pause it and go through these, think about it. You might actually be wanting to have a piece of paper and write some of these ideas down. Hopefully you've been taking notes. Well, now's the time to go a little bit farther. Work out some of these on your own. So suppose we're given P and Q points in E2, V and W vectors in R2, 
and do the following operations resu result in a point or a vector? P minus Q, 1 half P plus 1 half Q, P and V, P plus V, sorry, 3V, V plus W, P plus a half W. For each of these, you shouldn't just be guessing yes or no. You should be able to say, it is because. You might be asked that in class. Okay, here's the second question. Consider three non-collinear points. Form the set of the, all convex combinations of these points. What's the geometry of this set? Again, think about it, write it down, understand why. Okay, here's two more straightforward ones, some length questions. What's the length of this vector? How do you compute it? Write it down. Hopefully you can do it without looking back at formulas. What's the magnitude of the vector? Minus uh, 3, minus 3. Again, see if you can work this out with going back and, and looking at the formulas. And then you want to find the distance between these two points, P and Q. What's the distance between these two points? Sure you got that one. Um, find the difference between these two points, minus 3, 3, and minus 2, 3. Okay. That should give you some practice. Make sure you've gone through that before we get to class. Now it's time for an intermission. Take at least 50 minutes, get up, stretch, review your thoughts from what we've just covered. If you didn't take notes, now's the time to go back and jot down a few notes from the video, pull out your book, make sure you understand all of what was covered. Um, we'll actually cover the next piece in a separate video so the videos aren't too long.